turn it over to John. All right, Scott, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, webinar this morning. The topic, uh, as Scott mentioned, is going to be irrigation water management, uh, irrigation scheduling. So when we talk about scheduling, we're talking about uh, soil moisture tracking as well as soil moisture monitoring and managing that water for, for optimal resource use and efficiency. So here we go. <coughs> so uh, some questions you might ask yourself uh, about irrigation, uh, pertinent questions in terms of how much you should irrigate, how much water you should apply when you irrigate. And also, um, of course, given the conditions we had here in Wisconsin with, uh, with the drought this past summer, uh, the importance of monitoring soil moisture and actually knowing what's going on out there in your field. Uh, so these are some things that that we'll touch on as uh, part of our discussion here this morning. So obviously the uh, the energy link here is is uh, if you can if you can manage your your soil water, uh, you're not only uh, saving or conserving water, but you're also conserving energy uh, because you're not pumping irrigation water that you don't need to be pumping. So clearly there's a there's an energy cost uh, associated with this. Uh, something is a sound problem, Scott. Are you getting feedback? I'm, get, I'm getting some uh, some notes here. Can anyone? Can everyone hear me still? Okay. We're getting some notes that maybe we temporarily lost. There we go. Okay. I'll speak loud. Uh, not sure what's going on with the audio, but we'll try to try to keep everybody uh, everybody in line here. Okay. Good. All right. So the first uh, step we'll take here and in discussing this topic is to talk a little bit about the soil physics and what's going on with water storage and water movement in the soil profile. So as shown here on, on this slide, you'll see that soil water is, uh, water is stored in the soil profile in, in several different ways. Uh, if you look at the bottom down here of the, on the right hand diagram, you will see that we have saturated conditions. And under saturated conditions, the majority of the inner pore airspace, uh, airspace between the soil particles, is occupied by water. Generally, that's uh, in the order of 90 to 95 percent. There's always some trapped air that ends up uh, being uh, held within that soil profile. But we refer to this water as gravitational water. And uh, when we have uh, tile drain systems, those tile drain systems are designed to remove that uh, excess water off, and that's referred to as excess water, as it, uh, uh, it does impede the movement of oxygen through the soil profile. Uh, actually, uh, having saturated conditions like that uh, creates uh, anoxic, in an anoxic environment, uh, which will cause phosphorus and nitrogen uh, to be mobile uh, in with that water movement, so we can get uh, a lot of loss of nutrients uh, having a, a soil water regime in, in this type of system. Uh, as you drain that water out and you look up above, we have what is called the unsaturated uh, zone. And in that unsaturated zone, uh, we have, of course, a lot more air movement. But we've also got water still held in that soil matrix. Um, and it's held between the soil particles. Uh, against gravity by surface tension or capillary action. Remember uh, what capillary action is if you take a, a small diameter uh, pipette tube and place it into uh, a beaker or glass of water, you'll see that that water rise up higher in that small capillary tube uh, because of the surface tension of water. And it's that surface tension that's holding that water in that soil profile. So oftentimes, I'll get questions, well, if I put in drains, won't that drain out all the water out of the profile and I'll have dry soil and I, and I won't have a crop because my soil will all be dry? And that's not the case. That's, that's not how it works that, that uh, Mother Nature has provided for that in that that water is held in the soil profile by capillary action against gravity. And when you, when you first drain that soil, that amount of water that's held in there uh, at, 
at capacity, which is a, it's a function of soil texture. Uh, it's a main driver, but organic matter also can figure into that. But that's called field capacity when we talk about soil moisture for irrigation purposes. And uh, typically, it's denoted as a volumetric moisture content in inches per inch. And uh, as I said before, uh, soil texture figures into that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little later here. Um, the other side of the, uh, the coin is uh, as you start, you know, plant roots obviously can, can get into this soil profile. And this water is held in between these soil particles. And they can start removing that uh, through a process called evapotranspiration, which is you know, transpiration from the roots and, and soil surface evaporation. But the transpiration is the process by which the roots can extract that water from the soil. And so obviously, as uh, roots begin to extract that water, uh, at first, it's, it's quite easy to do. That, that water is pretty readily available. Uh, it's held uh, pretty nicely between those soil particles, and it's pretty easy for roots to extract that water. But as you continue to extract that water, you get to a point where uh, you don't have any more easily extractable water. And if you look over on the upper left, there's the uh, hydroscopically held water, which is when the plant root has extracted all of the water it can easily extract, that hydroscopic water is held very tightly to those soil particles. And that plant root can no longer extract that water. And that, uh, from an irrigation management standpoint or terminology, is called the permanent wilt point, or PWP. And as the name implies, uh, that's permanent wilt. You're not going to get uh, you're not going to get any more uh, water out of that plant and, or out of that soil profile, and that plant's going to going to going to wilt out and, and die eventually on you. So there is some additional water held beyond that that I'll talk about in a minute here. But another way to think about this, um, if you've ever had a dry sponge underneath your sink that you've taken out and uh, started to wet up under your faucet, so you let a little water coming out of your faucet drain into that dry sponge that you're holding in your hand. And as you, uh, if you have that faucet at a fairly low flow, you'll see that that, that low flow rate will be absorbed into that sponge. And you won't get any water passing through the sponge or through your hand. But uh, eventually, that uh, sponge will fill up. And its uh, capacity to hold that water will be exhausted. And more or less, your sponge is, is at field capacity at that point. And you'll start to notice that uh, water will, will start draining or begin draining out the bottom of that sponge. And that is the same analogy or analogous to what's going on here with the soil that once you exceed field capacity, you're going to get uh, deep leaching of that water deeper into the soil profile. So again, uh, some terminology here. We'll just review field capacity. Is that moisture content? That water will be held uh, after gravity, gravitational water is removed. Or in other words, that amount of, of moisture that's held against gravity in the soil profile. Uh, the permanent will point, or PWP, is that moisture that's in the soil profile after uh, you know, root or plant uptake uh, to the point where you can no longer get plant root uptake. And uh, so we kind of consider that to be an end point. If you look at field capacity as being the wet end point, permanent wilt point as being kind of the dry end point, we have a certain volume of water that's available for irrigation uh, between those two points. And that's called the total available water, or TAW. And some of that water is easily available within the TAW, and some of it is not. And there's a certain amount that's very easily available. The plant does not experience any water stress as it's, as it's removing that water from the soil profile. And from an irrigation standpoint, we can call that the, max, the maximum allowable depletion, or MAD. So it's that portion that can be easily extracted without any sort of plant stress or growth limitations. So the amount of water that we end up uh, managing in the soil profile is called the readily available water, or RAW. And if we look at uh, a mathematical calculation for that, that's going to be this totally available water times, I've got actually allowable depletion, 
which is the same as the MAD here, or maximum allowable depletion. So that's the uh, amount of water that can be easily removed uh, from that soil profile without uh, inducing plant stress. Now just a, another way of looking at this, this particular bar graph uh, diagram uh, illustrates what we just talked about, but uh, maybe in a little more graphic way. Uh, when you're, as you look at this diagram, remember that the uh, levels here represent different uh, amounts of soil moisture, and it's not the depth in the soil profile, but rather the total amount of water that could exist in a given soil profile. So here again, if we start at the top where we're at saturation, we have a certain amount of water that can be extracted gravitationally or by drains. That gets us down to the level of field capacity. All right, and as we continue to uh, remove water from that soil profile, we get down to some point here, which is within the range of the total available water, but it's actually at about 50% of that total available water volume. And that's uh, very typically the uh, amount of maximum allowable depletion uh, that we use uh, for most crops for irrigation purposes is we look at that first half or that upper half of the total available water. Now as you start to uh, withdraw down beyond 50% of TAW down into this next zone, the plant starts to experience some increasing stress uh, as it extracts that water. But it's not like flipping a switch and all of a sudden that plant's in, in stress. It's a, it's a gradual process. And if you're just a little bit below that total available water at 50% mark uh, for MAD, that plant really isn't going to, may not even notice that amount of stress depending on where it's at in its growth stage. But as you start moving uh, further and further down uh, this, this continuum of uh, water, available water, uh, the uh, plant stress, uh, the plant starts to experience more and more stress until, of course, you get down to the permanent wilt point where at that point uh, the plant can't extract any more water from the soil profile and you get down to a point where you're at unavailable water. Now, unavailable water doesn't mean that that soil profile is totally dry, that there is just a small amount that's available down here in the unavailable water range but that's generally uh, quantified by drying that sample on a 105 degree forage oven and actually measuring the weight difference to drive off that last bit of water. So uh, really what we're interested in from an irrigation standpoint is managing from field capacity down to, uh, well, permanent will point, but some point ahead of permanent will point, uh, a little greater than permanent will point as a kind of a range that we would want to uh, manage soil water in. And we'll talk uh, a little bit later here about some of the new irrigation strategies that people are starting to consider where at certain points in the points in the plant's growth stage, uh, for, for example, uh, vegetative growth development, you can hold off and uh, allow that uh, soil water to go into this, this uh, stress zone, if you will, or below 50% of maximum available and still have no crop impacts if you do that at the proper timing. But we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So moving on, the question might become at this point, okay, so how do we quantify the ability of a plant's root system to withdraw water from the soil profile? And here the soil physicists have helped us out a bit with a device called a soil water extraction device. Okay, and this basically is, is a vacuum cleaner, so to speak, that sucks water out of the soil samples. So as you can see, uh, we have a vacuum line here that's attached to a vacuum pump. Uh, we have a porous plate uh, and on the top of this device onto which we place several soil samples that are saturated. Um, initially saturated. So uh, once this uh, test is started, the device is turned on and various levels of vacuum pressure or suction are placed on all these samples. And so for example, the first, uh, the first stage you might 
take and put uh, maybe a tenth of a bar vacuum on these samples, which in turn draws a certain amount of water out of each of these little samples. After you've applied that amount of vacuum, you remove that small sample and do a volumetric uh, moisture content test on it. In other words, you take, place that, uh, weigh it wet, and then place it in a forage oven, dry it down, weigh it again, and actually calculate the volumetric moisture content that that sample was at at that level of vacuum. And then you continue that process for each of these samples at higher and higher levels of vacuum. So you can go right down through the whole scale all the way down to permanent wilt point. Uh, generally, this test is run down to about 15 bars uh, of vacuum, which is a, a lot of vacuum. But that allows you to define how much water can be held at different levels of, of soil suction. And the, the outcome of that is a curve that is called a soil water release curve. And this is a, a curve that is uh, specific to each soil type, uh, but is, is highly uh, affected by the soil texture class. So if you can imagine uh, where you've got a very sandy soil, you've got fairly large pores between the soil particles, and you would think, oh, wow, that soil's going to hold a lot of water. Well, in, the, the fact of the matter is it doesn't, it doesn't really work that way, that if you have a finer grain soil, you can have a lot more water holding capacity in that finer grain soil. So as this soil water release curve here illustrates, um, you've got a point up here at the top, which is saturation. That's where you're starting the test. And then on the x-axis, you've got soil moisture tension, or the same as suction, at different levels. And that's measured in bars. And on the y-axis, you have the volumetric water content. And that's in cubic inches per cubic inch, or the same as a percentage. So as you can see, as you continue to increase the suction level on the soil samples, that uh, you're releasing various amounts of water, and that you track how much water is released at each of those suctions. And you can develop this curve. All right. And as we talked about before, we've got some level uh, for each soil at saturation. And we've got, at about a third of a bar, we've got field capacity for a, a silt loam soil, which is a pretty common number. Uh, field capacities tend to range from about maybe uh, 10% or 15% for a sandy soil up to about 33 34% for a silt loam soil. So right there you can see there's a significant difference in the holding capacity, the water holding capacity for soils with different textures. And as you continue down this curve, you will see that we get out here to 10 to 15 bars, and we have permanent wilt point out here at about, uh, well, varying from 6% to about 16% moisture. Uh, so it's this range really here between field capacity at, uh, for the silt loam, 34% moisture down to permanent wilt point. Well, you'd actually be about halfway to permanent wilt point for your readily available water. And then you may drop down a little bit more than that uh, for a deficit irrigation strategy. But it's right in that range there that we would be managing irrigation or soil water uh, with uh, an irrigation water management system. Okay, So if we're looking at monitoring data, for example, uh, we have soil moisture probes out there in the soil profile. And if you start looking at the data based on what we've talked about for uh, field capacity and by definition how that behaves, this graph I think can illustrate, help illustrate how you can actually collect your field capacity information using your soil moisture monitoring probes for your specific case. In the, uh, you can ignore the red line in this case, but focus on the blue line and the green line. Okay, The green line is at about 13, 13.5%. That is the literature value uh, for this particular soil for field capacity. When we put the probes in, this was taken at our, our Hancock experiment station, and actually measured uh, 
soil moisture content, you will note this line at the about 9% or 10% level roughly. So if you follow this line across, you will see that it's relatively horizontal. And then as that soil water is depleted, you can see that that, that line drops down to 4 to 5%, which is actually a little bit probably too close to permanent wilt point. Uh, but early in the season, that's, you know, that can happen. But uh, then an irrigation happens, and that soil moisture comes back up. And then ET, or plant transpiration, root transpiration occurs again. That soil moisture comes down. And then uh, you irrigate, and it comes back up. So you've got this, this kind of up and down periodic level of soil moisture that happens in the root zone. But the, uh, the, the, the big indicator here is this level, okay? so that this line is level. So remember that when we reach field capacity, and we add additional moisture at field capacity, that water is driven deeper into the soil profile, but that that soil moisture level doesn't rise above field capacity. All right, Because at field capacity, once you get to that point, that water moves deeper into the profile and doesn't change its soil water content. You're still at field capacity. So this level line here indicates field capacity for that particular soil as it's being wet up. So if you monitor your particular soil, pay attention for a pattern like this, because that's actual field capacity data for your particular soil type. If you look up here at the green, you can see, and obviously there's some differences between what a soil survey might come up with versus what you might come up with for your particular soil. Again, there's differences in texture that can occur, uh, slight differences that a soil survey may not pick up. There's organic matter content. There's other uh, site-specific things that can happen that can affect your, your field capacity value. And since you're, you're going to be tracking soil moisture based on that field capacity value, you're going to want to know what that value is. So this is a good way to field verify that. All right, so just taking a look at some different soil textural classes and the field capacity and permanent wilt point values for those, you can see that for our sandy soils, we've got a fairly low range or difference between field capacity and permanent wilt point, which in turn translates into a fairly low total available water content. Obviously, these light soils are, are more difficult for agricultural production, and generally that's where you're going to find irrigation because you're going to have to, uh, not only because the soil texture is such that you have limited soil storage, moisture storage capacity, but also uh, oftentimes on crops such as vegetable crops that are grown in these soils, the root zone depth is limited, which also limits our, our total storage, water storage capacity of that soil profile. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the, the take home message here is that as you can see, um, as we, we get finer and finer textured soils, that we have more total available water to work with uh, from an irrigation perspective. Now obviously there's some other issues that come into play with the, the clay soils in terms of intake capacity excuse me, and how quickly we can get water back into that profile. And the cracking and whatnot that occurs can also help us to replenish those clay soils. But uh, like I said, the take home message here is that the differences in soil water holding capacity as a function of, of soil texture classes is something that's very important and needs to be considered in any type of irrigation management strategy. Another uh, aspect that needs to, to come into play here as far as monitoring soil moisture and tracking it is how that uh, soil moisture is extracted from the root zone. Here in this particular case, um, taken from the NRCS uh, National Engineering Handbook, we have a, a diagram that shows the, the extraction, soil water extraction patterns that uh, are typical for a crop. And right away, you can notice that about 50% uh, of that, uh, well, 40% extraction, 30, you got the majority of that water, 
70 percent of it is coming out of the upper 50 percent of the root zone. So in that case, uh, you know, plants are kind of like people. They don't want to work any harder than they have to to get what they need. So that's where the majority of that water is going to come. And that's really a function of plant root mass density. So the higher uh, plant root mass density you have, the greater the ability of that plant to extract that water. And generally, that's going to be in the upper half of the root zone. Uh, that's still not to say that you don't get some extraction uh, down deeper in the root zone. Uh, that's, of course, when you, when you exhaust the more readily extractable water up in the upper half, that plant will start going deeper for its water. It will also send its roots deeper into the soil profile to chase that water or find that water. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind in terms of timing of your irrigation. Um, there is a tendency oftentimes to over-irrigate uh, early on in the growing season. And that, of course, can result you know, if, if you have a lot of small irrigations early in the growing season, you're not going to get water moving very deep into the profile. And that plant's really not going to develop much of a root structure to go after that water. So holding back a bit on the irrigation earlier on in the growing season makes a lot of sense because you'll develop a nice, deep, healthy root zone system. And that, of course, pays off later on in the growing season when you've got really high demand for plant water. You've got a, a very a deeper root system that has access to more water. And of course, it makes the plant more drought resistant. It also gives you more flexibility as an irrigation manager as to how often you have to irrigate. And it's also good in terms of plant stability so that you don't get uh, lodging and the risk of plants uh, not having a, a sufficient root system to support their growth. But if you look here, we also have a probe, a deep probe, down in about 75% of the root zone. Now, there's nothing magic about these numbers. They can be a third, two thirds. We're just using 25% and 75% here as illustration. But the idea is that if you uh, know what the soil moisture is up here in the upper uh, extraction zone, uh, that will give you a good idea of when to start irrigating, when you start extracting a lot of this water out of the upper zone. And then on, this, on the lower part of the zone, down here at 75%, that gives you a good idea of what the bottom of your, your root zone is. So you can think of, of the root zone like a water tank. And as you as plants extract water from that water tank, you want to uh, be able to refill that at the proper time. And so one of the, uh, one of the issues here, of course, is uh, from a plant's perspective, as you're emptying that water tank, um, it's like standing next to it. As, as the level in that water tank starts to drop, you have to reach over farther and farther with your bucket to pull water out of that tank. Well, it's the same issue for a plant. They have to work harder to get this water out of the deeper part of the root zone. But also, you want to be able to utilize the full depth of this root zone for water storage. That's your tank. So knowing uh, what the water content is down in the lower part of that root zone is important in terms of refilling it. Because as you're irrigating, once you've refilled uh, the field capacity down to that bottom of the root zone, you know that your root zone has been adequately irrigated and anything else uh, any additional water that you put on beyond that is going to just be deep percolating down deeper into the into the soil profile and will be of, of increasingly limited use to your plant growth. And the other aspect of that, of course, is that as you drive this water deeper into the soil profile, you run the risk of, of, of taking nitrogen, but nitrogen that you're, that you're paying for, and solubilizing that into nitrate and, and basically leaching it down into the groundwater or into tile lines, and the, uh, also the risk of, of wasted energy and wasted water as you're pushing uh, nutrients and, and other materials down deeper into the profile beyond the root zone where you're, you, they're not useful for plant growth. Okay, So obviously, uh, different plants uh, have different root zone depths. And, this is another aspect of irrigation scheduling that uh, becomes very important, is understanding what that plant root zone depth might be. As you can see in the upper left corner, uh, for a potato plant and typical for many of the vegetable plants, uh, their root zone uh, depths uh, are not excessively deep. 
24 inches or a couple feet uh, is, is on the high end. Uh, here, uh, the potato growers up in the central sands tell me that 12 inches is kind of their, their managed root zone depth for potatoes in the central sands of Wisconsin. So you combine a shallow root zone depth with a soil, a light soil that has limited water storage capacity, and you've got a, a prescription or a formula there for irrigation about every other day, which is what you end up doing uh, when you're in the peak of the growing season and you're getting very high ET rates. On the other hand, if you look down at corn, uh, mature corn, uh, you've got a much deeper root zone system there, three to four feet, even down to six or seven feet in some cases. Uh, for uh, corn and soybeans also have the ability to create uh, and develop a, a pretty substantial root zone system. Uh, in the upper right, alfalfa, of course, is known for its tap roots that will go down to 9 or 10 feet. Getting irrigation water down that deep on a regular basis uh, is another story and is probably rather difficult to do, but that doesn't mean you can't uh, manage uh, down to three or four feet with irrigation and take maximum advantage of that soil water storage capacity uh, for that particular plant. This is just a, a, a table here of some uh, literature values for root zone depths and irrigation management or water management root zones. Again, as you can see, uh, a lot of those vegetable crops are on the shallow end. Um, a lot of the, the alfalfa and corn and soybeans are, are on the deeper end. So obviously, uh, there's a couple different strategies that you're going to want to use to manage these different crops uh, from an irrigation water standpoint. On the uh, far right two columns, you will see that uh, we've got a, a place for a shallow sensor or an approximate depth and an approximate depth for a deep sensor. Again, I was just using 25 and 75 percent of uh, root zone depth uh, or irrigation water management depth for this. There's no reason that uh, you couldn't use one-third and two-thirds. But again, the idea here is that you want some sort of an idea of what's going on in the upper portion uh, of your root zone uh, for your particular plant and what's going on toward the bottom of that root zone because that's, that's your active management zone. The other thing um, to also, uh, that you may also want to do is depending on your specific soil conditions, you may have uh, impervious layers or plow layers that can form uh, under in your fields, uh, and that will, of course, inhibit or prohibit root zone or root uh, penetration below that depth. For example, in the central sands here of Wisconsin, um, about 12 to 13 inches, they have a, a hard pan or a harder pan root zone that develops from tillage over time that uh, every year, every other year, they have to go in and deep rip that to try to break that up so that they can for, uh, better utilize that root zone. So keep that in mind. Uh, the other uh, thing that I guess I would recommend is that uh, as you're starting out your irrigation management or water management program, uh, maybe go out and, and check uh, your root zone depth. Uh, dig a hole next to some of your some of your plants and just see at the various stages, get a feel for what that root zone development is. It's going to vary uh, on a lot of things. Uh, you know, if you have a fairly dry year or a wet year, that's going to have an impact. But you can get a pretty good general idea based on your soils, your soil conditions, and your crop, what kind of root zone depth that you that you'd be working with, and kind of incorporate that system knowledge into your into your water management planning. So this is just a uh, another illustration of how soil moisture storage is specified uh, in some of the older publications. Uh, again, if you have an older soil survey, they'll use this older notation uh, in which the inches of water per foot is kind of the standard uh, notation that they work with. Uh, again, uh, the newer literature, such as the Web Soil Survey, the NRCS Web Soil Survey, will list the parameters for permanent will point and field capacity in uh, as a percentage, so inches of water per inch of soil versus inches per foot. But again, the conversion is pretty easy. Below there's an example for a loam soil. You can see that uh, if you've got a 17 
percent moisture times 12 inches per foot, you've got about two inches per foot of soil water stored in that soil. Whereas for a sand, uh, 0.08 or 8 percent uh, feet per foot or percent times 12 inches uh, per foot gives you like one inch per foot. So you've got about twice the amount of water holding capacity in that loam soil as you do that sand soil. Just a, another way to illustrate it, uh, but you may see this uh, notation in some of the older web soil surveys, and it's fairly easy uh, to convert between the, the two notations. So we talked a little bit previously about maximum allowable depletion, or MAD. Uh, the uh, kind of the take-home message here is that MAD, or maximum allowable depletion, is a depletion term. So uh, you're going to have a smaller value of MAD, in this particular case, 35% for a plant that's less tolerant of drought stress. Whereas a plant that's more tolerant of drought stress, your maximum, you're going to deplete less, so your ma or more in that case, so your maximum allowable depletion, or MAD, would be a little higher. And there's just some numbers here illustrating for different root zone depths what those depletion numbers would be. Remember, this is the amount of water that you're going to allow to be depleted from that soil profile as part of an irrigation management strategy. Uh, again, uh, plant growth stage can also play an important role in uh, when a plant can withstand water stress and when it can't. Uh, this table here generally uh, suggests that during the plant reproductive stage for corn, tasseling through silking stages, for soybeans, obviously flowering, those particular growth stages is when a plant is most susceptible to water stress. So uh, if you are using some type of a irrigation strategy that limits, uh, limits the amount of available water to some level below the readily available, you're going to want to make sure that you've got that water stress factor eliminated when you get to the growth stages, the plant growth stages for reproduction. Uh, those are kind of considered the, uh, the critical stages. All right, so when we talk about the amount of water that's extracted from the soil, we talk about this term ET, or evapotranspiration. And there's a couple of different ways that the uh, science of, of describing evapotranspiration has evolved. And, but the general principle is really the same. You've got uh, some factor, some uh, adjustment factor that we'll call a crop coefficient, or K sub C, multiplied by some reference uh, ET0 or reference evapotranspiration. This, this K sub C uh, crop coefficient accounts for things such as different crops and also, uh, and more importantly, and more critically, different growth stages. Uh, the transpiration term is, is highly dependent on the canopy development. And so obviously your crop coefficient is going to change uh, as your canopy develops. It's going to increase the plant's ability to transpire more water, so you're going to have a higher transpiration rate. So that's going to be a function of, of the growth stage as well. Then we have a couple of different uh, methods that have kind of evolved for calculating this. One of them is a potential ET, which is kind of a, a theoretical maximum uh, potential that a plant can transpire for the given amount of energy that's available, that energy being represented by soil temperature and solar radiation or net solar radiation. The other is a reference crop ET, where they actually have gone out uh, and measured the evapotranspiration with uh, like weighing lysimeters, which are essentially a scale that measures the, the weight change in the root zone for different crops, and commonly alfalfa and grass have been used for that purpose, and they're well watered, so they're not in stress. And then a reference ET value is calculated or derived from that, uh, from that number, and then that's adjusted based on the particular crop that you're using. Okay, so uh, again, the take home message here is that neither of these methods are absolute, but that that crop coefficient is kind of the adjustment or the fudge factor that adjust those values for your particular crop in its growth stage. And those two values have to correspond uh, in terms of, of what crop coefficient values you're using in your scheduling. Uh, the evapotranspiration uh, numbers can also be measured. Uh, there's commercially available gauges that uh, allow you to do this. Uh, they come with different uh, 
uh, covers that go on the top here, as you can see on the top of the gauge, uh, that will represent different reference crops, either a grass or an alfalfa reference crop. And then there's a level uh, on the side, a little level monitor that allows you to level the or to monitor the amount of, of water that's that's transpired from that gauge. These uh, do require some maintenance. Uh, they are uh, kind of pricey in, in the upper Midwest here. We typically don't see too many of these. Uh, they're, they're, I think they're more probably used more uh, frequently or more commonly out in the uh, in the western states. So as far as reference-based calculation methods, which is what's most commonly used uh, here in uh, Wisconsin and in other uh, areas of the country, uh, there's a couple of different techniques. Uh, the one I wanted to, to make you aware of is the Penman method. Uh, that Penman equation, which is an energy balance and empirical equation, has been uh, adopted by the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE, uh, under uh, code ASCE 70. And FAO, which is Food and Agricultural Organization for the United Nations, 56. Those are standards for calculating irrigation ET uh, and salt water extraction. Uh, we, in, partic in particular here in Wisconsin, we don't use that method. We use a, another one I'll talk about in a few minutes. But those, both that method has been adopted as a standard. In a short uh, crop height, uh, a grass, and a tall crop height. Uh, half meter alfalfa has been used in combination with this Penman method uh, for calculating ET. So uh, if we, we talk about that crop coefficient, as I mentioned before, that's kind of a, a fudge factor that uh, adjusts the reference ET to that particular day that you're doing that calculation. And as we said before, that's not an absolute number. So uh, given that it's a relative number, you can see it's going to be fairly low at the early stages of crop growth. And as you get more toward the peak stages of crop growth, it's going to increase. And the, what we're illustrating here is that that crop coefficient can actually exceed a value of 1. So 1 1.2, you know, depending on the crop. Um, again, it's just an adjustment factor. Uh, that adjusts that ET relative to the base number or the reference number that you're using. Okay. In Wisconsin here, uh, we have a humid climate um, as well as Minnesota. We have a, a system set up to monitor ET called the Agricultural Weather Observation Network. Uh, that's what A1 stands for. And we've connected that with the, our soil science department here has done an extensive amount of weighing lysimeter tests up at the Hancock Station. And we have found that the Priestley-Taylor, which is another uh, energy-based equation, works well here in Wisconsin for ET estimates. Uh, and so we have set up a, a system. Uh, several states have done this, uh, not only Wisconsin. Uh, Minnesota has a, uh, a system. Uh, Iowa has a system. Michigan, uh, Purdue also has a, a really nice irrigation scheduling tool that is, is connected. It's a national tool uh, that is connected with uh, a drop-down menu for different states to National Weather Service data. So uh, it's a, a pretty robust tool. But here, uh, we're using the Priestley Taylor. We have a, a grid that's set up. It's based on uh, automatically uh, gathering uh, temperature data from the airports. And then uh, it's combined with satellite-based based net solar radiation information. And from that, we're able to generate a daily ET number. And that number has been found to, to be you know, pretty reasonable, uh, 15 to 20 percent. Um, that's kind of on the outside. I think we found that our estimates are a little better than that. Uh, but we also uh, have a system set up that for people using a manual scheduling approach that that ET number for a given day can be emailed to them automatically. Uh, it can also be uh, automatically downloaded uh, into our newer uh, web-based scheduler that we have here uh, called WISP. Uh, so based on the longitude and latitude of a particular pivot, uh, it will automatically update the ET for that pivot on a daily basis. So uh, on the precipitation side, obviously that's another input to our soil, uh, water input to our soil, a very critical one, in fact. So having uh, 
accurate measurements of rainfall uh, is important. Um, here we've got a, a gauge that was developed more for an arid region, uh, Nebraska, Kansas. Um, it has a collection uh, cylinder here, but down toward the bottom of that's a rather small hole that drains into uh, a measurement bottle. That small hole uh, at the bottom of that uh, collection tube uh, helps to uh, reduce evaporation rates. So if you're in an arid area that has fairly high evaporation rates, uh, you're going to want to use a rain gauge that, that accounts for that or corrects for that. This particular gauge is something that can be homemade out of PVC uh, pipe sections. Uh, so we made this here. Uh, the, uh, in arid regions, uh, you know, uh, here in, in the upper Midwest, it's not as critical. Uh, a regular rain gauge uh, will work, but it's important that if you are using uh, just a regular rain gauge that you want to get out and read that gauge uh, fairly quickly after a rainfall event to try to reduce as much as possible any evaporation that would come out of that gauge. Also, uh, kind of a standard recommendation would be three rain gauges per field. Uh, rainfall is highly spatially variable, and you want to try to, to pick up on that as much as you can. Again, remember here that uh, that's somewhat dependent on the size of your field. If you have fairly small fields, one may be sufficient, but for very large uh, areas, uh, you're going to want to have uh, some additional rain monitoring out there so that you know, uh, you know what's going on spatially. So as far as tracking, um, the tool for tracking soil moisture would be uh, what's called the checkbook method. Um, it's like your uh, checkbook would be for a bank account. You've got certain deposits, which are inputs uh, of water to your soil root zone, which would be rainfall and irrigation. And then you have certain outputs, which of course are deep drainage and ET. And then you have a, a storage or your balance, that change in storage in the soil root zone. So uh, the idea behind this soil water tracking approach is that you only water when you're necessary, when it is necessary, and that you're able to maintain a more consistent soil moisture content in the root zone of that crop. So uh, there's several computer programs. Um, earlier I mentioned or just spoke of, of we have a couple here, a, a spreadsheet-based program called WIS, W-I-S, and a web-based program that we're just uh, developing called uh, WISP, Wisconsin Irrigation Scheduling Program. But certainly, uh, there's other programs out there. Kansas uh, has a, a real good program called CanSchedge. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Purdue scheduler. You can just do a web search on that and to find that. Uh, Minnesota, Michigan, uh, I'd say just about anyone who's doing irrigation has some type of software for scheduling. Uh, we used to use a manual approach here in Wisconsin, which of course required uh, recording uh, everything on a sheet, a paper sheet, and doing daily calculations. Uh, with uh, computers that we've got out nowadays, uh, that is a, a much better way to go, especially uh, with these web-based uh, applications. You can have those on a, uh, a mobile device, uh, so you can take them out in the field with you and actually uh, monitor and make adjustments uh, right there and know right in, in, your, in the field what your uh, soil moisture is. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but also uh, what your irrigation needs are for that particular day. So just a kind of a, a quick over on, overview on what irrigation scheduling can and can't do. Obviously, there's a benefit to irrigation scheduling and that it really uh, can, if it's done properly, reduce your chances of over-irrigating, uh, which is kind of the common tendency is to over-irrigate, uh, which uh, in turn uh, results in uh, end losses through leaching uh, and leaching of other, uh, if you're using other types of ag chemicals uh, leaching into either tiles or shallow groundwater. Uh, you can uh, improve, improve the consistency of your root zone soil moisture content. And if uh, you are using some type of, of a strategy to uh, uh, manage uh, soil moisture and maybe uh, reduce irrigation at certain times, an irrigation scheduling program can help you kind of track that. But also, um, in the long term, it may help you reduce your irrigation and energy use by allowing you to take advantage of natural rainfall. And again, uh, that's going to depend on your soil type and your root zone depth 
uh, the degree to which you can take advantage of natural rainfall because having that greater amount of storage through a finer textured soil and deeper root zone depth gives you a greater window of time to work with so that you can actually take advantage of uh, some uh, natural rainfall events. One thing uh, irrigation scheduling and water management won't do is, is not going to reduce the total plant consumptive water use. There's a certain amount of water that the plant needs to produce a crop, but if you can deliver uh, that water, I think, in a more uh, intelligent way in terms of the plant's growth cycle and maybe hold back more during the early vegetative growth stage and really make sure you've got the water there during the reproductive stage. Some of the preliminary uh, data that we have collected here in Wisconsin suggests that following a, a little bit more of a rigid strategy, that way you can reduce your overall consumptive water use, especially for crops that are more drought tolerant. So in terms of a soil moisture tracker, uh, this example that I'm showing here is from our uh, Wisconsin Irrigation Scheduler, uh, or WIS. It's an Excel spreadsheet. And so on a daily basis, you're tracking what your ET is. You're tracking what your daily rainfall, your daily irrigation. You come up with an adjusted ET that's based on what that crop canopy looks like. The uh, ET over on the left column here is your reference ET, and that's adjusted by the crop coefficient. You've got a, a storage and then a change in storage that occurs each day within that root zone. And then we've added a, a calculation here that calculates what that readily available water is based on a maximum allowable depletion of 50%. You can change that in the program if you'd like. But in this particular case, we have it set at 50%. And it actually gives you a readout here in inches per day and a percentage in moisture uh, percent. So if you have soil probes out there that are reading in percent moisture, it gives you both. So essentially, this uh, readily available water, or RAW here, is the plant water that you're, that you're managing for. And so for this particular example, field capacity is 3.06 inches. And if you add water, over here I've done an example to add a uh, rainfall of one inch when the uh, soil is at uh, field capacity. And so the model tells you that you're getting deep drainage. It also turns the font red as an orange, or as a warning for that. Um, this does happen quite typically early in the season before plant canopy has had time to develop. And the ET rates are low. You get those spring storms that come in, and you will, you will oftentimes get deep leaching. That's, that's the greatest risk for deep leaching is during that early part of the growing season. Now, we also talked a little bit about managing soil water, but maybe not filling that tank all the way up. So down here in this example, uh, to the 70% of field capacity for this particular soil is about 2.1 inches. So if you manage your soil water content up to 75%, of the readily available water or the RAW depletion, that leaves you about 30% of that tank, so to speak, where you can accommodate natural rainfall. So by not using what we call a full irrigation strategy, which fills that soil profile all the way up each time, you're, you're positioning yourself this way to take advantage of natural rainfall events, which is obviously going to pay off because Mother Nature doesn't charge you for that water. Um, again. The ability uh, or the extent to which you can do this is going to be dependent on how much storage, soil water storage you have, which in turn is a function of your root zone depth and your soil texture. Okay. So down below here, I've just given another example of the spreadsheet, the way it's set up. When you deplete the readily available water, which is 50% of the total, remember, and you're starting to get into that stress zone a little bit, it gives you a negative number and turns the font blue so that you know you're down below. Your, your readily available water has been exhausted and that uh, you're starting to uh, get into that area where uh, there may be some plant stress. Now, going into that plant stress zone, a small amount um, is not going to be an issue. But as this number gets larger and larger, the stress on that plant uh, increases. The other thing you need to think about um, if you are going to manage down in this lower moisture content zone is the capacity of your pivot to recover from that. 
So if you're running fairly low soil moistures and you're going to get into the reproductive stage of that plant, you've got to make sure you have enough pivot capacity or irrigation capacity to bring that water level back up to a non-stress level so that it's there for that plant when it needs it at, at reproduction time. So just some things to keep in mind. Again, at the bottom down here, uh, we irrigated back. We put a couple tents on, and we're back up to a full irrigation um, a full irrigation strategy, which is when you're at field capacity. So just a, a little bit about how this chart works. There's also a column here where you can put in this blank column your actual observed soil moisture so that uh, and then the, the scheduler will actually use your observed value from that point forward in time. So um, obviously, soil moisture monitoring, which we're going to get into next here, uh, is really important. And uh, that allows you to ground truth your scheduler here and, uh, and keep the two both in line so that you know what you're dealing with. I talked a little bit about the full irrigation strategy. Again, uh, irrigating back up to field capacity. Whereas the deficit strategy, uh, you would, would stay a little bit below that um, so that you could uh, take advantage of natural rainfall events. OK, so now we're going to transition into soil moisture monitoring. Um, and I guess from a personal perspective, uh, I consider this to be a, an absolutely critical aspect of any soil water management plan that you know a scheduler uh, is just the best estimate. And any errors that go into that estimate can accumulate over time. So you really need to have some soil moisture monitoring out there to be able to monitor what's going on and know what's going on. All right. So in this particular slide, we've got two moisture probes. We have a shallow probe and we have a deep probe. And the illustration here, the take home message of these, uh, this again is done by soil uh, suction. So we have centibars on the y-axis, which is matrix suction. Uh, that could just as well be percent moisture if we were measuring it that way. Um, and then on the bottom, we have time, basically growing time. So again, remember with soil moisture suction, the higher the drier. That's kind of the, the take home message there. So the higher that suction is, the drier the soil. So you can see that we start out here in the early stages, the early growth stages. We have a little bit uh, more moisture in the lower uh, part of this probe than lower probe than we do in the upper. But you can see as the plant growth occurs and ET happens that uh, the values start to go up. The curve goes up. That means the soil is getting drier. Well, in the shallow probe, um, if we were going to do an irrigation here, a shallow irrigation, you'll see that that uh, soil moisture content is satisfied in that soil suction drops. Okay, so that's it's getting wet in the shallow probe. So good, we got water at the shallow depth. But you'll notice on this deep probe that there's no change. What that is telling us is that that water is not getting down into the deeper part of that profile. So that shallow irrigation is not filling the soil profile and therefore not taking full advantage of the water storage that's available. Uh, the second diagram illustrates for deep irrigation, you can see that you're hitting both probes and you're getting that whole uh, soil profile filled with water. Okay, So again, having a probe in the shallow location um, those tells you when to start irrigating. Your deep location can tell you more about when that water gets down to that lower depth and you can stop irrigating. Or if after rainfall events you're going to get leaching events, you'll at least know about it. Several methods to measure soil moisture. A hand feel method, a tensiometer, which is a, a device, also called a mechanical root, that measures that soil tension directly. Uh, resistance blocks, uh, also a method to measure soil moisture. We're going to go into each of these in more detail in a few minutes. A TDR probe, which is an electronic probe. Uh, capacitance sensor. Uh, and then, of course, you can, can take all of these different technologies and combine them uh, into uh, a data logging management system uh, for, with telemetry to, to transmit that data to a central location and process it. The field method, um, it's a good method. It's inexpensive. There's a great NRCS publication out there, uh, this Estimating Soil Moisture by Feel and Appearance. Uh, obviously, all you need is a, a soil probe in, in your hand. But the one uh, cautionary note, I guess, I would uh, mention here is that you really need a way to calibrate your eye and to, to calibrate your feel 
of that soil and know what a, a 10 or a 15 or a 50 percent moisture feels like. So if you're going to use the feel method, uh, you would want to use that in conjunction with a probe. And once you've done that enough, you'll, you'll be able to hit it right on. So calibration of your eye and your, your senses is a really important aspect to that. Potentiometer, again, works like a mechanical root. This has a porous cup down here at the bottom that's in contact with the soil. You uh, pound in a, a rod, which makes a hole. Uh, you put the, uh, some water in that hole. You put the tensiometer in there and allow that to equilibrate with the soil. This, this uh, tube here is actually filled with distilled water. Um, and then you put a, a suction device on here that sucks any air, trapped air out. And this gauge right here is a vacuum gauge that reads, reads vacuum or suction. So relatively inexpensive. Obviously, there's some additional maintenance required to keep bugs from growing in this tube, as well as uh, the issue with freeze and thaw. So but tensiometers are, are, are certainly a good way to measure soil moisture. They come in different lengths so that you can get different depths into the root zone. And then you have some guidelines. If you have an actual soil water release curve for your particular soil, then you can very quickly and easily determine what the percent moisture is. But in terms of, of having some general guidelines, uh, these, uh, this slide gives you those guidelines uh, in terms of uh, when you need to irrigate and, and when your soil moisture suction or tension starts getting real high. Uh, gypsum blocks, it's an electrical device. Basically, the amount of resistance that uh, the block experiences is proportional to the amount of water. So when these equilibrate with the soil, uh, you can measure soil moisture content that way. Uh, you have a meter. One meter will work for many probes. Uh, one of the things is that uh, they're only good for one season because that probe or that sensor will, uh, will dissolve in the soil. Electrical resistance block, it's another tool. The sensor is fairly inexpensive. You can have one reader to read many sensors. These are a little more robust than a lot of the uh, like a tensiometer would be. It's really like a tensiometer. It reads in suction. Um, it's also uh, fairly inexpensive. Uh, gives you gives you a reading in, uh, in, in in soil moisture suction, so it's really kind of an electronic tensiometer, and the manufacturer provides a calibration curve or kind of a generic soil water release curve that you can use to convert your suction from your 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 sensor back to percent soil moisture, but obviously having an actual soil water release curve for your soils is, is the best way to go. TDR is an electronic device measuring the dielectric of the soil. It actually comes from the phone company used to use devices to find underground breaks, which use the same technology, but uh, a more pricey, more expensive sensor, but also very uh, accurate and very dependable. So a lot of these are used in research. Again, any of these sensors, you can buy them as a hand probe, where you carry it around, stick it into the ground, or you can bury an actual sensor and uh, leave that in the ground and, and collect the data from that. Capacitance sensor, also an electronic device, uh, very accurate, a uh, little less expensive than the uh, TDR probe. Uh, but again, these need to go into undisturbed soil. So very often, you just dig a post hole or a trench, and you place the sensor vertically into the side of that trench, and you'll get uh, uh, your soil moisture readings that way. So uh, the sensor itself is more expensive, but uh, they can be reused, and uh, they're a, a very good sensor uh, type system. Uh, fairly robust. You can leave them in over the winter. Again, as I mentioned, for different types of sensor configurations, you can have the portable handheld unit, which is obviously the, the portability uh, has its advantages in that you can go anywhere in the field and, and track that moisture. It's a little more difficult if you're trying to get to subsurface moisture. You generally need to carry a shovel and, and dig down and stick that sensor down into the ground or perhaps set up a, a tube that you would cap if you can get that sensor down in the ground that way. Uh, in, the, in, the place, in the case of, of, of put-in-place sensors, uh, the tensiometers, the resistance blocks, those types of things require uh, a continuous connection to the soil matrix. So those are, are generally left in place. Those are more or less in-place type uh, sensors. But all these uh, types of sensor technologies can be hooked up to both data loggers to uh, constantly data log and record your data. Or what's more common nowadays is telemetry, where you've got either a local system uh, 
where you're, you have a, a local radio receiver and a set of repeaters that you would put out in the field to real-time send that data to your desktop. Or uh, the latest uh, technology that's very popular is using cell phone technology. That the sensor uh, will actually log data, uh, and then it has a, a built-in cell modem that will, uh, on a on your specified interval, set up and, and transmit that data four to six times daily to a website via a data link on a cell phone. And these are, are really becoming popular. Uh, of course, there's more cost involved. You have to have a cell data plan, and you have to have a, uh, a sensor with a cell modem in it. But then that data is uploaded to a secure website that you can access any time you would like. And so any place you have, obviously, you have to have cell service. But uh, that's pretty common nowadays. So uh, these, are, these are pretty popular units and, and, and quite dependable. So uh, we are talking a little bit about irrigation strategy for deep versus shallow crops. crops. Again, having that deep root zone gives you high water holding capacity, gives you greater days um, between irrigation applications, uh, which in turn gives you an increased ability to use rainfall and reduce the number of leaching events. So it's like having a bigger tank okay, that you can store water in. Uh, obviously, for a deep crop, uh, you want to put on water at less frequent intervals and put on more water when you do so that you're fully utilizing the storage that's available to you in that root zone. And so increasing that depth of application is, is to your advantage. The, obviously, the disadvantage with shallow irrigations or frequent small irrigations, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, you don't get a good root zone development. So first of all, you're not taking advantage of the full storage volume in that root zone uh, that you have available to you. And also, you're increasing the risk of not the plant not developing a deep root zone. So plant lodging or plants falling over as a result of wind uh, and other uh, meteorological conditions can be, can be a problem in that regard. So, Again, it always depends on what your, uh, what your particular situation is, your soil types, the plant, the type of crop you're growing, and, and how you wish to manage that. But uh, that pretty much wraps up what, uh, what I had uh, prepared for today. And uh, I guess I will turn it back to Scott if he wants to come on and finish up. All right, do we have any questions for John? Hearing none or seeing none yet. Um, this has been recorded and uh, will be available.